Hey guys, welcome back to my channel for a very special video. Today's video is in collaboration with one of my favorite true crime YouTubers, Joshua Miles. He's doing a series over on his channel called The Summer of True Crime Collaborations. He's been collaborating with a bunch of true crime YouTubers over the month of June. There is a playlist in the description box, so make sure you check it out so that you can watch every single video in The Summer of True Crime Collabs. If you like true crime, which you obviously do because here you are, then make sure you go ahead and check out his channel. I'll have that linked as well in the description box down below. I also did a video with him over on his channel. So after watching this video, go ahead and check that video out too. In today's video, we'll be discussing the case of a South African serial killer, popularly known as Buti Bur, but whose real name is Stuart Vulcan. Vulcan was not only a serial killer, but he was also a serial rapist, a necrophiliac, and a self-proclaimed cannibal too. He was active for eight years from 1990 all the way up to 1997 and in his eight-year killing spree he claimed the lives of 10 victims. It's possible that he claimed more than 10 victims, he has confessed to killing more than 10 victims, but his confirmed kill is 10 victims. I just want to say that by making this video, we mean absolutely no disrespect to any of the victims or the families that were affected by this case. This video is purely for educational purposes and to give the viewers more information about this case. Warning, the following video contains mention of violence and sexual assault, as well as the abuse of minors from the onset and throughout. Viewer discretion is advised. Stuart Vilken was born on the 11th of November 1966. And Vilken was actually born in a town called Gottsberg in Gutang, South Africa. He was born during the apartheid era of South Africa and was the youngest of two children. Now, Vilken actually had a elder sister who was two years older than him. And when Vilken was just six months old and when his sister was just two years old, their parents abandoned them in a phone booth. Now a phone booth was a public phone that you could use and pay for using coins or a telecom calling card. Now I have to point out that at the time, a lot of these phone booths were basically just metal frames. They weren't the stereotypical phone booth that you see in, you know, in London or in America. They, a lot of the time, didn't have walls and they didn't have roofs either. They were simply just a metal frame with a telephone inside of it. Fortunately, through a massive stroke of luck, the pair were actually found by a domestic worker and that domestic worker then took the pair to her employer. Unfortunately, her employer employer was actually an abusive man and this man was called Doab. Now I'm just going to say now that I apologize for any pronunciation errors in this video. I have asked my father who is South African how to pronounce things but <laughs> any of you who watch my channel will know that I'm not the best at speaking really, pronunciations at all. Now this employer called Doab, he was extremely abusive towards Vilken. He would burn Vilken using his cigarettes on his genitals. Vilken wasn't allowed to eat with the family. And the little food that he was actually given was also the same food given to the dogs. And he was forced to eat out of a dog bowl, just like the other dogs were. Now Diab, as I am pretty sure you've gathered by this point, is not a good person at all. Not only was Vilken being physically and psychologically abused by Diop, he was also being sexually abused too. Now the sexual abuse was actually in the form of Diop performing bestiality with his dogs and it is believed that Vilken was a witness to these events. And after Diop was finished with the dogs, he would force Vilken to lick his penis. Now Vilken actually lived this miserable and horrendous life for about a year and a half and during this year and a half his older sister actually went missing and disappeared and he has no idea what happened to her. Now at the age of two Diop's neighbours Mr and Mrs Vilken actually decided to adopt the toddler. They decided to adop adopt Stuart. Now, Mr. and Mrs. Vilken being neighbours to Diop, they were very much aware of the abuse that was going on, or at least they had some inclination as to this kind of abuse that 
uh, Stuart Ville cannot always facing. So out of the kindness of their hearts and their compassion, they decided to adopt Vilken. Now the time of his adoption, Stuart Vilken was actually nameless. However, he did call himself Boaty Bauer, which means little brother farmer. The Vilkins, his new adoptive family, gave him the name of Stuart Vilkins. He took their last name. And it wasn't long after Stuart was adopted that the family decided to move to Port Elizabeth, which is a major city in the Eastern Cape province. During his childhood, he was always getting into trouble. He was getting into trouble at home, he was getting into trouble at school, he was a troublemaker. This was likely due to the effects of the abuse he had suffered from an early age and due to his behavioural problems and his learning problems as well, he did not do very well at school and he in fact failed grade 3, which was known as standard 1 at the time. He failed grade 3 three different times. Another issue for Vulcan was the fact that he was adopted. The other students at school, they bullied him relentlessly for this. And according to Vulcan, his teacher actually encouraged this bullying. And one day, he was being bullied by the other children. He was being made fun of. They were calling him names, beating him up. And the teacher was just egging them on. The following day, fueled by rage and the embarrassment of being made fun of in front of everybody, Vulcan assaulted his teacher and for this he was severely beaten by his principal in front of the whole school. At the time corporal punishment was the norm, it was widely used and it wasn't seen as absurd, it wasn't seen as any type of abuse. So teachers and principals could just beat children however much they wanted basically. Like I said, Vulcan's behavioural problems were not only an issue at school, but at home as well. When he was acting out, he would often beat and bite his adoptive mother, and her way of punishing him was by locking him in his room. Vulcan also claimed that not only did his adoptive mother lock him in his room, but sometimes she would even lock him in a dark closet. <sighs> That's pretty scary to be in an isolated place as a young child, no way of escaping, locked in a tiny closet that is dark. You don't know what's in there. Children are generally afraid of the dark sometimes. And with his history of abuse, I can just imagine how traumatic this experience was for him. Vulcan was also a bedwetter. And this is quite common for victims of sexual abuse. For his bedwetting, he was also punished. According to him, when he would get into fights with other children, his parents rarely took his side, even when such fights were instigated by the other children. At the age of eight, he started experimenting with marijuana. At eight years old, he got into drugs. Now, life didn't get any much easier for him, and in fact, got much much worse. When he was just nine years old, his adoptive father actually passed away, and that happened very suddenly. It was unexpected. Now, Vilkin was very, very close to his adoptive father, and his adoptive father played the only positive father figure role in his life. In fact, it was the only positive male model role in his life, too. No, there'd be no, no other positive male figures in his life. Now, in the same year that Vilkin's adoptive father passed away, a deacon from his church actually invited him back to his home after Sunday school. And when they got back to his home, this deacon sodomized Vilkin. And this further enforced in the mind of young Vilkin that men were abusive and they could go out and take what they want from others. Now, Vilkin's behavioural problems began to spin out of control and they got worse and worse and worse. And Mrs. Wilkin was unable to deal with this. She was very overwhelmed. So she made a very, very tough decision to send Vilkin to reform school. And this was a decision that would actually make Vilkin's already very traumatic life much, much harder. At this reformatory, Vilkin was actually bullied by a lot of the older male students there, and he was actually beaten and sodomized by them. And due to his deteriorating behavioural problems, he would be constantly punished 
finished and constantly disciplined. At one stage, he was beaten and locked up without his clothes as a punishment. Now, Vilkin had tried to run away from this school on numerous occasions. However, each time he would be found and sent back to the school. Now, after completing grade 11, Vilkin decided that he would enlist in the army, but Unfortunately, after just four months of being in the army, he was discharged, and that was due to a suicide attempt. Now, at this point in his life, not only was he employed, but he only had an education up to grade 11, which means he didn't finish high school, which finishes at grade 12. So with nowhere else to go, he decided that he would move back to live with his adoptive mother, Mrs. Vilken, in Dispatch, which was a small town just outside of Port Elizabeth. Now, in the early 1980s, on a night out, Vilkin actually met a woman called Lynn, and fortunately for Vilkin, this woman would become his wife. And on Christmas Day of 1985, Lynn and Vilkin welcomed their first baby into the world, and this baby was a baby girl called Vuwene. It is important to note that Vilkin was just 19 years old at the time of his daughter's birth. Now, with a wife and a brand new baby and this new family, you would think that Vilkin's traumatic past would be, you know, left in the past, but unfortunately, this was not the case. The marriage between Lynn and Vilken was not a happy one in the slightest. Now, Vilken was actually abusive to his wife. He had assaulted her on numerous occasions, and as a revenge and as a way of getting back at Vilken, Lynn had him arrested for smoking marijuana. Lynn claims that after Vuwene's birth, Vilken would only have anal sex with her, which would oftentimes be in uncomfortable positions. And Vilken claims that during the course of their marriage, Lynn actually turned to sex work, and that added further tension to their already unstable and unhealthy marriage. The 11th of February, 1990, marked a momentous occasion for South Africa. After 27 years in prison, the man who had become South Africa's first democratically elected president Nelson Mandela was released. In that same month, at the age of 23, Vulcan claimed his first life. Monty Fico was a 15-year-old street child from Port Elizabeth. Due to the socioeconomic situation in South Africa, unfortunately, there are a lot of street children back then in 1990 as well as today. Due to his circumstances, Fico presumably turned to sex work in order to make money and to survive. And in February of 1990, he was approached by Vulcan. He took Fico to Cilius Secondary School in Sadenham, Port Elizabeth, where he proceeded to sodomize the teenager. When Fico complained that Vulcan was hurting him, he became enraged and strangled the teenager. At the exact moment of his death, Vulcan ejaculated. On the 3rd of October of that same year, Vulcan and Lynn got into a huge argument, and after this argument, Vulcan picked up 25-year-old sex worker Virginia Heisman at Russell Road. Before they were intimate, he paid her and he took her to Dachbriak Primary School. They had sex, but when Vulcan penetrated her anally, unexpectedly so, Heisman protested. Once again, Vulcan strangled his victim, this time with her own clothing. And at the moment of her death, he ejaculated. He left her body on the school property where she was later found by a groundskeeper. Vulcan and Lynn's marriage continued to deteriorate and eventually they got a divorce. After this divorce, Vulcan vowed that he would never again sleep with a white woman for fear that it might be his long lost sister. Lynn eventually got remarried and she had other children but her story does not end here. More on that at the end of this video. Just 10 days into the 1991 New Year, Vulcan was solicited by 37-year-old sex worker Mersha Papenfuss at the Red Lion Hotel. The pair went to St. George's Park, but when Papenfuss demanded her payment prior to intimacy, Vulcan flew into a rage and he strangled her. 
He then sodomized her corpse and left her body in the park. On the 21st of October, Vulcan met another street child, this time a 14-year-old boy who, according to Vulcan, agreed to have sex with him for money. They also went to St. George's Park, and when the teenager demanded his money, Vulcan got furious at this boy. When the boy tried to flee, he was overpowered by Vulcan's sheer size. Vulcan was a big man. He was a fisherman by trade, and he was six feet tall. He was big in stature. He was pretty big, so he easily overpowered this boy. He then sodomized him and strangled him. With each of his victims, his sexual satisfaction came at the exact moment of their deaths. In 1993, Vulcan repeated his crimes against yet another street child. Once again, a teenage boy. His victims were either sex workers or teenage boys that were most likely street children. It's quite rare for a serial killer to have two distinct type of victims and due to the difference in his victims, it took quite some time for the police to put two and two together and to figure out that it was the same person committing these crimes. After he sodomized and strangled his victim in target cloth, he hid his body in the ravine. This next detail is quite disturbing, so if you don't want to hear any disturbing details, obviously everything that I've been talking about is disturbing, but this next one is particularly gruesome. Just skip ahead about 10 to 20 seconds of this video because, yeah, it's, it's pretty gruesome. During his trial, Vulcan admitted that he would often return to the scene of his crime to perform necrophilia on the victims. More often than not, the victims that he was returning to were the young boys. He rarely returned to the sex workers that he had murdered. Obviously, having been left in the open for sometimes weeks on end, the bodies were decaying and they were usually infested with maggots. To prevent the maggots from crawling up their cavities, he would insert rolled up newspaper in their orifices so his necrophilic acts could continue undisturbed. Clearly, this is a very, very, very disturbed and depraved individual. He had already murdered these victims. He had already sodomized them. He had already committed necrophilia after the fact, immediately after the murder. And then he would still return to defile and degrade them even more. The satisfaction of killing his victims wasn't enough. He had to strip them of their dignity, even after death. Now, sometime after his divorce and in the midst of his killing spree, Vilken actually met a coloured woman who went by the name of Veronica, and Veronica actually had two children from a previous relationship, and those two children were both sons. Vilken and Veronica actually went on to have two daughters together, however, Veronica's family didn't like Vilken at all. They actually accused Vilken of sexually abusing Veronica's children. This alleged abuse was actually escalated and reported to the local authorities, and this actually forced Vilken to go live in the bushes near Happy Vale. This marriage inevitably came to an end after just five years of being together. Now, during his trial, Vilken actually stated that when he went drinking, he would go on a hunt for sex workers. He was often a heavy drug user, often mixing Dacha with Manjax in his drug-fueled killing sprees. Now, for those of you who are not aware, Dacha is is marijuana. Now, his reasoning for seeking the services of sex workers was due to the fact that his wives and girlfriends were refusing to have sex with him. Now, I can't really personally blame them for not wanting to have sex with someone who sodomizes his wives and girlfriends and even his own children, allegedly. Now, on the 27th of July, 1995, Wilchen actually met a black sex worker who was 42 years old, who went by the name of Georgina Bonisoir Zwini. The pair went to Prince Albert's Park, where Vilken committed his most gruesome and horrifying attack yet. As per his usual ritual, he sodomized and strangled Zweeney before once again ejaculating at the moment of her death. 
Thereafter, he would proceed to sexually assault her with a knife. The wound was actually in a star shape, and this was because Wilken would put the knife in and take it out and put it in multiple times, over and over again in the same spot. In all, there was over 20 different stab wounds in and around her genitals and her lower abdomen. Zwini was also a victim on which he actually committed cannibalism, and Wilken did this by cutting off her nipples and consuming them. On the 29th of September of that same year, Wilken's 10-year-old daughter, Vuan, disappeared. She was last seen by her half-sister, who was Lynn's daughter from a previous relationship, and she was seen sitting about 150 meters from her house, the house that she lived with with Lynn and her new stepfather. She was seen with Vulcan. At the time of her disappearance, Vulcan was still married to his second wife, and he would often visit Vuan and Lynn. After his daughter's disappearance, Vulcan was inactive for more than six months. Then, on the 25th of May 1996, he solicited 22-year-old sex worker Katriana Klaassen at the Albany Road Interchange. He took her down to the beach, stuffed her throat with a plastic bag to prevent her from screaming, and then he raped, sodomized, and strangled her. According to Vulcan, the reason that he targeted sex workers was because he hated women that exchanged sex for money because they apparently reminded him of his first wife who he believed to have been a sex worker during their marriage. He allegedly killed them in order to save them from their immoral acts and send their souls to God. Every time Vulcan sodomized his victims, he did so facing them so he could experience what he called the jelly bean effect when he strangled them. This was when their eyes would bulge out and their tongues would become swollen due to the pressure he created by strangling them. He enjoyed watching the life drain out of his victim's eyes. This gave him great sexual satisfaction and the pleasure of knowing that he was in control of their lives. Somewhere between May and August of 1996, he met yet another street child whom he took to Fort Frederick. After the boy masturbated him, Vulcan told the boy to undress and he sodomized him. When the boy threatened to tell the police about this, Vulcan strangled him with a belt and killed him. But based on his activities thus far, it's pretty obvious that Vulcan was intending on killing this boy whether or not he had threatened to tell the police. Vulcan's reasoning for targeting young boys and street children in particular was because he did not want them to go through what he went through in his childhood and he believed that by killing them he would send their souls to God. In 1996, the skeleton of a young girl who was believed to be between the ages of 6 and 12 years old was found behind the Garden Court Holiday Inn Hotel in Port Elizabeth. The skeleton was found under a tarp and it was quite obvious by the condition of the skeleton because it was at this point just a skeleton that it had been there for quite some time. After forensic investigation it was determined that the skeleton had been in that particular location for approximately six months. The identity of the skeleton would remain unknown until 1997. Henry Baker was a 12-year-old boy from Algoa Park in Port Elizabeth. Henry's mother, Ellen Baker, had allegedly even been in a relationship with Wilken, with Wilken even apparently living at his mother's house for a short period of time. Now, Henry was a typical 12-year-old boy who loved playing with his friends and loved spending time with his family. Henry would often go visit his grandmother who lived in Mission Vale, and that was only a short distance away from from Algoa Park. On Wednesday, the 22nd of January, 1997, after spending the day with his grandmother, Henry departed his grandmother's house and headed back towards Algoa Park. Now, when Henry didn't immediately return that day, his mother Ellen wasn't that concerned. She just believed that, you know, Henry probably is just staying a little bit longer with his grandmother. There was no cause for concern. But then when Thursday evening rolled around and Henry still hadn't come home, Ellen 
she grew very, very worried. So she decided that she would go over to her mother's house, Henry's grandmother's house, and, you know, go see what, what was going on. So she went to her mother's house, Henry's grandmother's house, on the Friday morning. And when she went there, her mother informed her that Henry had actually left two days prior, and he had not been seen since. The Child Protection Unit was immediately contacted, and Sergeant Ursula Bernard was assigned to the case, and Sergeant Ursula was assigned as the head investigator. Now, a friend of Henry's was actually questioned by the investigators, and this friend told the investigators that they had seen Henry walking with Vilken on Dyke Way. This friend had asked Henry where they were going, but Vilken piped up and said it was none of their business. Now, like I mentioned previously, Vilken was actually a known person to the Baker family. He had even stayed at, as Ellen's guest at Ellen's house for a brief period of time. However, St. Barnard actually struggled to find Vilken because he didn't have a permanent address. Now, during the course of the investigation into Henry's disappearance, St. Bernard actually discovered that Vilken was being investigated on two different sodomy charges. And these were two charges which were in connection to his second wife and Veronica's two sons. These charges were were levied against him by his in-laws. On the 20th of January in 1987, Vilken was actually arrested in connection to Henry's disappearance. Now, during his questioning, he was very forthcoming with information to the police. He seemed really, really eager to help the police and told the police that he had actually been with Henry on that Wednesday, but he had no idea as to his disappearance. Now, Vilken's alibi was that he had actually spent the night with a lady friend, and this seemed to be somewhat believable, and subsequently, Vilken was actually released. After further investigation, Vilken's alibi was actually determined to have been falsified, and he was arrested again three days later, on the 31st of January, 1997. The case was handed over to Sergeant Derek Noseworthy of the Murder and Robbery Unit. Sergeant Noseworthy had actually been trained by South Africa's first profiler, who is someone that has been mentioned on this channel quite a few times before, and he was Dr. Mickey Pistorius. Sergeant Norsworthy had actually been trained in the investigation of serial murders, which was actually Pistorius's speciality, and that included using advanced interviewing and interrogation techniques. Vulcan began his confessions with the words, I am sick. Then he admitted that he had killed both his daughter, Vuan, and Henry Baker, and that he had in fact returned to Henry's decomposing body that very morning in order to have sex with it just before his police interview. He also told police that on the 29th of September 1995, after suspecting that his daughter was being sexually abused by her stepfather, he took her to a secluded area in the bushes at Happy Valley, where he inspected his daughter's private parts and discovered that she was no longer a virgin and had been defiled. The half-sister, who was the last person to see Vuan, did state that the family was poor, that their stepfather didn't like them. He was physically abusive to them. There's no confirmation if he was sexually abusive to them. But sometimes there wouldn't be any food in the house. He would often visit her body and talk to it as if she was still alive. He would lay out clothes next to him as if Vuan was wearing these clothes. Vulcan still maintains to this day that he never had any sexual contact with his daughter before or after her death. He later moved her body and hid it behind the Garden Court Holiday in Hotel. Her skeleton was found six months later in 1996. Finally, after his confession, the unidentified skeleton now had a name and identity attached to it. On the 3rd of February 1997, he was charged with 10 counts of murder and 5 counts of sodomy. Because of his choice in victim, which was sex workers and street children, these were people that are generally not reported missing, and as a result, their cases were put on the back burner. It took police months to put together a case to go through all the dockets and files and collect all the murder evidence and necessary information for his trial. 
During his trial, he showed absolutely no remorse for his crimes. He didn't look away when gruesome and horrific graphic images of his victims were displayed to the courtroom. He even went as far as to masturbate in the court bathroom during his trial. Pastorius classifies him as a serial killer that can not be rehabilitated. Over a year after he was charged on the 20th of February 1998, Vulcan was convicted of seven counts of murder and two counts of sodomy. And three days later, on the 23rd of February, he was sentenced to seven terms of life imprisonment. He was 31 years old at the time of his sentencing. The judge presiding over his case, a judge Chris Janssen, told Vulcan that had it still been available to him, he would have received the death penalty. Vulcan asked the court to give him a long prison sentence at a prison with psychiatric facilities so that he can, and I quote, receive treatment and one day, if ever I am allowed free, I can also live life as a normal person, unquote. I just pray and I hope that he is never ever released because like Pastorius said, he, the chances of him being rehabilitated are slim to none. It is believed that he is currently serving his life sentences in St. Albans Correctional Facilities on the Eitenhacha Farms in Port Elizabeth. So that is all the information on Stuart Vulcan, but before we end this video, we just quickly want to touch on his first wife, Lynn, whom he shared daughter Vuan with. In the year 2000, Lynn married a man from Kirkwood named Hermanus Havanche, and this would be her third husband. On the evening of Friday, the 2nd of June, 2005, Lynn was walking to a telephone booth accompanied by one of her children from a previous relationship to phone her husband, Hermanus. Three men ambushed the mother and child. They grabbed Lynn and forced her into the back of the car, but the child managed to escape. Unfortunately, the next day at 6.30 in the morning, Lynn's body was found in the salt pans of Mission Vale. Superintendent Joan Van Graen stated that she had been hit over the back of the head with a blunt object. And then it was later confirmed that she had actually been bludgeoned to death by a brick. Now at the time of this heinous incident, Lynn actually lived in Algoa Park and was actually expected to join Havenga in Kirkwood at the end of June. They had been married for five years and Lynn actually received a state disability benefit. The case remains unsolved to this day. So with that unfortunately heartbreaking ending to Lynn's life, it does bring us to the end of this video. Thank you so much for watching. If you did find this video interesting, please go ahead and give it a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. Thank you so, so much to Joshua Miles for collaborating with me on this video. The first link is to the Summer of True Crime collabs, so do go ahead and check that out so you can watch every single video that Joshua has put together with various other content creators here on YouTube for this Summer of True Crime collabs series. With all of that said, thank you so much for watching. Bye guys.